nice to see Genlan back. I'm so happy to see him. And uh, Genlan is, he is the fulfillment of a dream of mine. Here about this Menla. You know the Menla, some of you who haven't been here? How many of you have been here for the first time? I don't think the sound is on. Can you hold up your hands? Sound. sound. Yeah, he's still putting on. Anna. Lots of people have been here already. Quite a while, quite a few times. That's good. So you know all about Menla then. But those who haven't, let's just say, Menla is the Tibetan for Medicine Buddha. And uh, Tibetan for Medicine Buddha, okay. And uh, no. Now it's working. You're, you're maybe on mute. Yeah. And uh, so I'm just doing a welcome introduction. You know, since Michael is not here, you know. Oh. Both both on together, but maybe she turned this one on at a time. So, um, uh, Menla means medicine Buddha, Men Ye Lama, the high teacher of medicine, by Sanjay Guru. And uh, so, when I was a young monk, at the age of 23, my old Mongolian teacher, he forced me to study Tibetan medicine. I wanted to meditate, attain enlightenment. He said, you'll attain enlightenment later. <laughs> Meanwhile, you better learn Tibetan medicine. <laughs> and he showed up at the little room where he was leaving me in Dharamsala in 1964 uh, with the Dalai Lama's physician of that time, Dr. Yishi Dandan. Yishi Dandan? who was a disciple, one of the two main disciples of the Kenan Norbu, very famous doctor who was there with the 13th Dalai Lama. And uh, that Gela Yishitan then was re-establishing for working for His Holiness as his personal physician and re-establishing the Tibetan Medical and Astrological Institute, in, which had been in Lhasa, and uh, taking care of His Holiness's health also. And. Uh, so, Meza looking man, his face looked like a Garuda bird. He had cheekbones like this, and the ears were in a perfect line with the cheekbones. And it looked like, a, it was a symbol of medicine, like an eagle called Garuda. And, um, you know, then uh, I studied for a year or so, he made me see the pulse, I memorized the pulse, and de Lola But then I never practiced, I wasn't able to really practice in those days. So I often wondered why. I, my, my, my root teacher made me do that, <coughs> although I loved doing it once I started, I must say. It's such a fascinating system to it, medicine. It's really the Buddhist medicine system of India, then added many things by the brilliant and, and clever Tibetans. So, um, in the, starting in the 8th century, and finalized by this great man with a small statue here of the Yutok, the younger. <coughs> who finalized it in the, in the four tantras and their commentaries and so on. And uh, so, but, uh, and so this place was given to Tibet House, whose mission is to preserve Tibetan culture in a time when China is kind of trampling on it in Tibet proper, although there are some pockets where it's still alive. And many pockets, actually, in the hearts of all the Tibetans, it's still alive. Even the ones sent to China to only learn Chinese, they still are Tibetans. You know, they feel they have an identity of being Tibetans. And uh, so this medicine is the matrix of the culture, kind of. What you eat, you know, how you live, your ethics. And it connects to the spiritual thing of seeking enlightenment, becoming a Buddha, and so on. So it's a marvelous, marvelous, it's like a beautiful silk pavilion summer tent in which the Tibetan people flourish. And, and Genla, but I never had a partner among Tibetan doctors. There are many Tibetan doctors in America, but they all have other work. And um, you know, we have, we've never had the funds to have someone here all the time. And, uh, and, um, and then Genla showed up. Genla has been living in the West for some time, but he's also back in Tibet all the time. And he helps so many people there. And he's also a Nakba, which is like a shaman, 
a Buddhist shaman, Nyingma uh, order, <laughs> and um, non-sectarian, and um, dealing with all kinds of deep energies in the universe. And um, he's the dreamed of partner of the Menla, Menla plan. And when His Holiness um, asked me to take care of Tibet House, originally when we started it, uh, I, I said, I'm sorry, I don't know how to do that. I don't have the money, I'm not famous, I don't, whatever. And he said, no, you're going to manage. And I was feeling very nervous. And um, it was in Dehradun. And I dreamed that night that um, the Tibetans themselves will save their culture. And one of the key ways they will do it is with the medicine system. Because their medicine system has insight. It's not like it's, everything's wrong with modern medicine. There's a lot of good things. But there's many bad things, too. And stemming from materialism, you know, the dogma of materialism. There's no mind, everyone's a robot, a biological robot. You're just a brain running around thinking you have a mind and all these kind of stupid ideas. And, uh, so it needs partnership with a system that doesn't just say it's bad and we're going to go back to something, but we'll work with it and complement it and supplement it with the spiritual side, with the, to returning back to the nature side, and uh, we'll see a renaissance, actually. When, as the Dalai Lama has always said, you know, the outer science, which the Tibetans have developed, which the Westerners have developed, is we've done a lot of great things, but also it's brought the planet to a dangerous impasse at the moment. And the inner science of the Buddha has done a, many good things for millions of people for thousands of years about their minds and about their lives and about what the, it's all about sort of thing and their, and their happiness. And has brought happiness to millions and millions of people all over the world. And when, they, when they, it gets together with the tools of the outer science, and the deeper worldview of the inner science, then we could have a real Shambhala, you know, Shangri-La, Shambhala, real Shambhala on the planet. That's his idea. And the medicine is the place kind of where that will happen. So Gela is, and he is unique, that in my knowledge, among Tibetan physicians, in that he has revived the practice of the outer sciences, the outer therapies, what are called external therapies. Most Tibetan doctors just give the herbal pills or sometimes uh, tea or different things. And um, they don't do so much the outer, what are called the outer therapies, which Genla has developed. And actually, people invite Genla in Tibet itself. And um, I guess in India soon, they invite him to help them revive, like massage and uh, cupping and tapping and I don't know what you don't do, <laughs> popping and all kinds of things. And these are all in the ancient texts. But somehow, the, the herbal things are so effective, actually, and were so effective. And it's still, they still thrive in China and India, where it's a legal medical system, that uh, they, they haven't really gotten into the, these things that he does. And that's, they are the best way of introducing this system to the US. So then, by a miracle, Tibet House was given this place to make a spa, Tibetan medicine-based spa. But we didn't really have the right medicine man <laughs> until Genla showed up. And of course, we can't monopolize Genla. He has students and patients and colleagues uh, all over the world. And uh, he, he, um, uh, but he, he comes regularly. And we're very blessed to have him come. So welcome, Genla. Yes. Very, very much. Now, would you like to speak a little bit before I do the inner science? Gela also likes me. The only reason I'm here, you know, I'm an ignorant person about medicine, and I'm deeply, deeply ill myself all the time. And I want a new body, but I can't because I, I get one when I die and get reborn, for sure. But, um, I, and I uh, hope it will be a decent one with the blessings of his holiness. But, uh, 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 so I'm just here, though, because Genla likes me to compliment, to show the connection between what the Buddhists call the inner science, and the inner science is really Buddhism, what people call Buddhism. It's really the, in, in Tibetan's own, and in Indian before that, Adyatma Vidya, it was called in the great Indian universities. It was called the inner, interior science, or inner science, Advihatma, within the self, science. So, 
Uh, and then the Tibet and the medicine is the f most important of the outer sciences. Then within Tibetan medicine, there's the outer therapies and the inner therapies. But that's, you know, they always complicate. It's so intelligent. Okay, so, but would you like to, to do a little introduction again first before I start off on inner science? Please do go ahead. And welcome. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so happy. And I'm going to mute my mic and, and you unmute yours. That's the thing. So we don't get a one. Uh, thank you. Feedback. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> So, um, I don't know what to say, <laughs> <laughs> because you are here now. Uh, no. Well, if you don't... Okay, uh, so, uh, do you have this book? Actually, you can use that book, yeah. Yeah, grab some copies. <clears throat> so, I would like to start from here, page number... Do you want to it, it's called, yeah, pass them around. It's called Origin of Imbalances, you know. Origin of the pain, origin of the suffering, so the origin of the sickness. Yeah. And uh, yeah. <clears throat> so according to Buddha, there are four types of uh, sufferings for human beings. And uh, suffering of sickness, suffering of aging. Do you know the other two? Suffering of sickness. Nobody wants to get sick, right? The suffering of aging, nobody wants to age. And then suffering of? Yeah. Death. Death. Nobody wants to die. And then there's another strange suffering, it's called suffering of rebirth. <laughs> nobody wants to come back. <laughs> After death, nobody wants to come back, but unfortunately everyone will come back. <clears throat> nobody wants to die, everyone will die. Nobody wants to get sick, everyone will get sick. <laughs> nobody wants to age, but everyone will age, right? So somehow, <clears throat> probably getting sick and, uh, you know, aging and dying, it's a natural process, but we don't accept it. We try to refuse it, reject it, and so on. <clears throat> so in page number 63, there's a chapter about the origin of imbalances. So that's the talking, <clears throat> you know, we're talking about, uh, <clears throat> so why, uh, how do you say, we get sick and why we get edge and why, why, we ha why we have pain and suffering, all right? So it's a very interesting part. Because somehow here, uh, Tibetan medicine is called the Sowa Rigpa. So here you see in the, the title, Sowa Rigpa, the signs of healing. All right, and then uh, we are using in Soarigpa we are using the main uh, Buddhist philosophy, so that's why our talk is like perfect connected, you know. <clears throat> and especially when we talk about what is the root cause of the sickness, root cause of uh, aging, and the root cause of pain and suffering. And so, in the page number sixty-three or sixty-two, you see there, is a, there are three leaves here. So those are called the three mental poisons. Okay, three mental poisons. And uh, the three poisons of mind. So first one is desire. You can call it the desire or attachment. And then second one is anger. And then the third one is ignorance, right? So why we get sick? Because of our ignorance and stupidity. And we get sick because we are stupid. <laughs> Does it make sense? Okay, and then we get sick because of our anger or hatred, and then also we get sick because of our desire, <clears throat> or I think normally it's translated to attachment. The chak, rather. Attachment? What's that? The chak, attachment. Yes, yes. <clears throat> sure. Attachment. Passion, lust. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's interesting, you know, today. <clears throat> Uh, today we all know about the stress, physical stress and psychological stress. And uh, <clears throat> actually I call it that the stress is the modern inner monster. You know, it's a so powerful monster and this monster gets everyone. You know, from the grandkids to grandparents. <clears throat> right? Did you, did you notice today, like, the young kids, they start to talk about stress? Uh, five, six, seven years old, you know, they talk about stress, and they talk about anti-stress. 
And uh, so, <clears throat> of course, elderly people, 80, over 80, 90, also they talk about stress, right? So, and then, <clears throat> according to scientific research, also it says uh, more than 60% of our sickness, uh, both physical and mental, they are connected with stress. So basically, more than 60% of sickness, it's stress-related sickness. And then, so what is the anti-stress, you know, what is the antidote? For that, it's, yeah, it's, uh, how do you say? It's not easy, you know, we don't have a scientific solution. Of course, probably there are some chemical pills, it's called anti-stress, anti-anxiety, anti-depressant, you know, anti, 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 there are so many anti. <laughs> and people are really uh, believing that uh, our society, it's a chemical society, and we think that chemicals are the solutions, right? But if you look carefully, chemicals are not working. If chemicals are working, why the, the numbers of the patients are increasing, right? The numbers of patients are increasing. And then somehow, like, all the chemicals are becoming like a food. Even you eat it, not enough. You have to increase the the dosage of the medicines. <clears throat> and so that's why I think it's very important <clears throat> to find another solution, you know. <clears throat> we know we have many problems and sickness, whatever, but <clears throat> the answer, the remedy is not only the chemicals. So I think that's really, really important, right? And if we look at the modern medical science, of course, scientifically there is operation, the physical solution, and then everything is based on the chemical solution, right? All medicines. <clears throat> and so we really believe in these two parts, you know, or uh, uh, physical surgery or the chemical-based uh, treatments. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's very important to see the other kind of natural uh, treatment, the natural <coughs> solution. But in that case, we have to know what are the root causes, right? And so here it says the root causes are three poisons of mind, three mental poisons. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, if you look at the page number 63, the lower part, actually talking about the five poisons and the five primordial wisdoms, okay? So, in the Buddhist philosophy, and basically we talk about three uh, uh, poisons, inner poisons, but we can say also five inner poisons because of the five elements, right? And then, so we have the pride, we have ignorance, attachment or desire, jealousy and envy, and anger, anger or disgust. So there are five poisons. And then these five poisons are connected with primordial wisdoms. All right, so that, that's the all, how do you say, uh, system of Swarigpa or the Tibetan healing signs. Actually, we are talking about, uh, how do you say, it's a, like inner alchemy, you know, alchemy system, right? And we call the inner, uh, our uh, negative emotions, they are poisons. But then what poison means, what's the definition of poison? Poison is something harmful. So the, all these our negative emotions can be harmful, but same time also we can use the poisons as a medicine. Right? So at the end, the poisons is up to us how we use it. And so that's why <clears throat> I think this part is a really... Uh, if, you, if you know about the Greek alchemy, Greek alchemy, you know, in the, in the Western culture, Greek alchemy is talking more about uh, uh, heavy metals and, you know, physical transformation, uh, transformations like uh, chemistry, uh, chemistry studies. And uh, Tibetan alchemy and Indian alchemy, we have this too, you know, to working with sulfur and mercury and all these things. But Tibetan Buddhism, Vajrayana, it's a very precise inner alchemy, you know. It's really talking how we can transform the poisons into the medicine. Or if you don't know how to use the medicines, they become poison, right? So it's like a food, you know, every food, it's a... Uh, Every food, basically the natural, natural and seasonal, local and seasonal food, they are good food. But if we don't know how to cook them and how to, how much we eat and so on, so they become uh, poisons or they can cause the troubles. And if we know how to use the food, that's the best medicine, right? 
<clears throat> so that's why the inner, how do you say, the alchemy about emotions, about wisdoms and uh, mental emotions, how to work with them, that's the main work of Buddha. You know what Buddha means, right? What Buddha means? Buddha? Yeah, yeah the meaning of Buddha? <laughs> awake, awake, awake. Awaken. How do you say in Russian language? Wake up. No, Buddhit. Buddhit. It means wake up, right? Arlam o'clock, Russians, they call it Buddhit. So Buddha is actually like Arlam o'clock. You know, Buddha is saying, we are simply get lost with desire, anger, and ignorance. We have to wake up from this hour the uh, illusion dimension or the dimension of the poisons. That's called the Buddha. So that's why Buddha talks very precisely all about the inner emotions and how these inner emotions they can become in wisdoms too. Right? Actually Buddha talks about uh, 84,000 mental afflictions, nyonmo. Yes. 80... Addictions, like mental addiction. Mental addictions. <coughs> mm -hmm. Habits. Mental habit, mental addictions. So I think, you know, Buddha was one of the best human psychologists, right? Today, if you look in Western psychology, the, the classification of the mental disease, how many of them? About 20, 30? So Buddha, he found like 84,000 mental problems <laughs> for humans. That's why we are in trouble. <laughs> That's why like, we kind of get lost in this illusion world. Illusion and world. And so that's why uh, this is the main reason also the connection between Tibetan medicine and Buddhism. You know? right? So Tibetan medicine goes very deep to try to find out what is the, really the root cause. Okay? And then the founder of Tibetan medicine uh, <clears throat> uh, was Yuto Yunden Gombo. So you can read like this backside. He lived actually 125 years old. So in his philosophy, he believed that the human body has a potential to live until 100 years. All of us, you know, we can live, we can reach 100 years, all of us in a natural way. And if we know like some special, uh, how do you say, remedies or special diet or special yoga and meditation. Next days we'll do these things. And then we can even extend, you know, we can live more than 100 years, right? So that's why we believe that he lived until 125 years old. And then later he had this spiritual realization, his body becoming a rainbow body. And the good thing is, yeah, he left all his knowledge for us. He said, do the same do the same way what he did, right? So at least we try to live until 100 years. Are you ready, Professor? Yes. <laughs> I'm going to try. To live until 100 years. I'm going to try. <laughs> so, the, yeah, in Tibetan medicine, when we talk about the root cause of the sickness, you know, sickness is root cause of uh, aging and so on, and then we are talking about this inner poisons, and that's the main subject of Buddhism. Right. Shall I, shall I do that? Yes, yes, please. Okay. So, and then we'll come back to more detail in the medicine. Tomorrow. So, right. Oh, tomorrow. <laughs> okay. So, um, the shock might be to some of you uh, that from our point of view, from the Buddhist point of view, Put it on. Uh, Buddha is more of a scientist than a prophet or a holy man. He is? A, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, mute. I take the mute off. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's my, thank you so much. Bye. Yeah, it, it'll work. No, 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 just take the mute off. Now it will work. I guess. If Justin, he went away. Is there, do you hear? Everyone hear me? No? no. Um, some Justin must have dusted some knobs somewhere. There we go. Yeah. So, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I can just use scanlines. Thank you, Gemma. Okay, good. Fine. No, no problem, Eric. It's okay. And um, Buddha, as a scientist, this is a shock. And um, I think I, I was, it's my life purpose, I think, to point this out in this culture. <laughs> I had a funny dream, Gela, when I got my PhD. You know, modern people who study Buddhism, like scholars in universities, they, they think 
Enlightenment, they don't believe there is such a thing as enlightenment, waking up. And they don't believe that Buddha could have been enlightened, because Buddha didn't have a PhD <laughs> from Harvard. <laughs> and therefore he couldn't be enlightened. And he lived thousands of years ago, and those were all backward people. And there's all these concepts about our culture that are really deluded, but they're totally into it. And, um, and uh, I had the funniest dream when I got my PhD in 1972 at Harvard. Um, I didn't go to that ceremony. For some reason, I don't like those ceremonies. I, I don't like the costume. I had been a monk. And, you know, they wear a funny hat that's flat on top, you know, and I thought that was really a black hat, you know, like, like a bricklayer's hat or something. I mean, it's really strange. So I didn't go. But I had a dream that night that my very kind, nice professor who was Japanese, um, and he knew something, Sanskrit and so forth, he knew a little Tibetan, but actually I knew more than him, because I'd been a Tibetan monk, but he was really kind and nice, he helped me. And uh, in the dream, he was handing me some kind of you know, pen or scroll or some, you know, some honoring thing for having gotten my PhD. And uh, I was in a field somewhere, like, with him, receiving in the dream. I think at the time they were having the ceremony. And then I looked up in the sky and I saw a nuclear cloud, like a nuclear bomb. And nobody else noticed it. So it wasn't physically happening, obviously, even in the dream, but it woke me up. And it took me years to discover what that dream meant. But what it meant is that, you know, materialism, which is the worldview of the modern enlightenment, you know, coming from 17th, 18th century, uh, which enabled colonialism and the conquest of all kinds of people all over, a lot of genocides and things. So here, right here, we're sitting on top of the Native American people, you know, European, those of us who are European American. and. Uh, and made us very powerful, and then we thought it was really fixing the whole planet like 100 years ago, the end of the 19th century, going into the 20th, before the First World War. Everyone thought that, you know, you know, the world robots would take over and it would be nirvana. The, 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 the World Fair in London, 1896 or 1898, something like that, was a moment where the crystal, they built a crystal palace and they thought technology would take care of everything. And there's still many, many people who think that. And as you notice, nowadays, the ones who think that are all shooting rockets up in the air because they're all planning to head for Mars <laughs> because they're recognizing that they're wrecking this planet beyond repair, actually, with their stupidity of this materialist ideology. And uh, so I think I was reborn, maybe from Amdo, maybe from Tibet or Mongolia or somewhere, to try to overthrow that delusion. And I've been arguing for years about former and future life with these people, you know. And only lately did I finally come to a clincher about it. Maybe some of you also believe that you doubt that you're going to have a future life, maybe. But, um, you know, I, what I asked when I ran into a colleague, you know, in our, my university, the high priests of my university are the natural scientists. And even the psychologists do animal experiments, so they're even doing animal sacrifices. You know, they, they slice the brain with like a very fine prosciutto slicer, but they get certain <laughs> dyes and things of these different kinds of cats and dogs and things. They do horrible things. And, and, uh, and that's, but that makes them important. But the point is, I tease them, I say, did Carl Sagan show up to any of you guys and say, it's all fine, I'm nothing, and you're going to be nothing and just completely eternal sleep of unconsciousness and no knowledge and no hello you ever did live the minute you die. So you're out of all your problems. I mean, you're not going to be in a barrel of ice cream. You're not going to be in Mela in a paradise, but living in a lotus, but you're going to be extinguished forever. And this is scientific fact. Did he show up and report that? Of course, they say no. And then I say, therefore, you say you're a scientist, and you are empirical, and you try to discover what you can experience. That's what you go for. You don't go for dogmas, right? That's, you got rid of that when you escaped the church, right? You got rid of the Inquisition and the whole thing. I said, but what's the evidence that nothing is there waiting for you? Could there ever be, not only is there no such evidence, there never will be any such evidence, because nothing isn't there. That's what the word means. 
There is no there about nothing. It's not here. We're never going to be nothing. You, in your materialist thing, you have the law of conservation of energy. It always continues. And you are some kind of energy. So that's what you should expect. You don't know how it will be. And then you have different people have described it in other cultures that didn't have this dogma due to fear of hell and fear of the being doomed by the church or whatever, you know, having a negative unconscious. You're going to not exist just by dying. And you can wreck the planet or you can bomb civilians or you can do all kind of reckless things because worst can happen is you become nothing and they become nothing. So this is the reckless, irrational, and totally blind faith-based scientific materialist culture. I know you, maybe some of you would like to argue that with me, and I look forward to that. But I'm just saying that, and this, what this means is that Buddha, you know, he spent, you know, he also, he had a lot of interesting future lives. You know, he was right, a remarkable young man as a prince. He learned a lot. He was quite a lover. He had a lot of fun, very fun-loving as a prince. And he was in this situation where his dad created like a pleasure palace for him even because the dad was told that if Buddha got really into lust and passion and, and even kinky things, that he might stay and be a king and be a householder and he wouldn't go off to attain enlightenment. So the father was desperately trying to get him to stay in the family business, which was being a king and a, and a general and a warrior. And, uh, and so he had it fun. And then he spent six years examining his mind and like, leaving his body out of it, making, harming himself almost, actually. And then he, but he finally came to a place where, according to the claim, he developed perfect understanding of the nature of reality. Unlike Moses or Jesus or different Hindu, you know, Upanishadic people. He didn't meet Krishna or Yahweh or Jesus or anybody who told him, go and save people or something, or tell them, I'll save them. He did actually meet the deities of that culture uh, who the people, other people believed in, and he didn't disbelieve in their existence, and he met them and talked to them. And they admitted to him upon discussion that they didn't quite understand what was happening. They were just the top dog in the world. Brahma, that is Brahma, the creator. He, one of Buddha's disciples went to see him and asked him, what was there before earth, water, fire, wind, air, and you know, and you're the creator, so you should know, and you should know how you did it, and you know how it all works. I'd like to know how it works. Please tell me. And then that Brahma said, do you have an appointment? <laughs> and tried to hem and haw and not answer. And then finally he left, to the, you know, that guy left disappointed and, you know, and he said, oh, so sorry, sorry to bother you. Sort of a Wizard of Oz story, actually, an ancient one, thousands of years old. And then, then Brahma came out, you know, God came out of the heaven where he'd been talking in the throne room where there were other godlings, you know, in his, in his court. And he said, hey, come over here. And so the guy said, oh, don't, no, don't punish me. I didn't mean to bother you, you know, I'm leaving. He said, no, 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 I couldn't send you away like that, he said. I didn't tell you the truth in there because I didn't want those godlings to freak out. But the truth is, I didn't create it, I don't know how it works, and I'm just a big shot here, you know. And I don't mind being worshipped by people who think I created everything. But then when things, ter horrible things happen to them, I don't like them getting angry with me. And uh, thinking I created that, you know, like when they lose their children, or when they're sick, or when terrible things happen. I don't like that. So you go back to the earth and you find your, go back to your teacher Buddha and you ask him how it works and he will be able to help you find out for yourself because he has, does understand. So there's a sutra like that in other words. And they didn't burn them at the stake or arrest them. Jeff Sessions didn't put him in prison or anything, the Buddhists who had such a, such a doctrine. About lack of omnipotence and how the human being, so, so Buddha discovered Reality, in other words, is in those cultures what we think. And he, 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 ahead of Einstein by thousands of years, he discovered relativity. The famous emptiness doesn't mean that there's nothing somewhere. Emptiness means that all relational things are empty of any non-relational element. Like a person, there's nothing non-relational about any of us, our bodies, our minds. 
We're all interwoven and interrelated with each other. There's no atom that's, in, that's non-relational, no essential core to anything. Actually, there's not really any atom. Atoms are also illusion. He predicted the infinite divisibility of matter, even that time. So he came up with that really, he achieved already the grand unified theory that, you know, Einstein was looking for. Remember? He tried very hard to get, he, he refused quantum theory. The quantum people in 1926 said that the deep level of reality, you could not capture it with mathematics or theory or anything. There was no absolute objectivity out there that you could pin down and have something correspond to in order to control it. That was basically happened in 1926. And Einstein rebelled against it, and most of the natural scientists are still confused about it. And they're not giving up, you know, they're going to have a bigger electron accelerator, they're going to do more things, they're going to find that core essential thing about reality, unify gravity and electromagnetism and strong force and weak force, etc., etc., have a grand unified theory. In other words, something they can put in a computer, sit back and control reality. With their same intact ego ecosystem through their language, and and their of course their high, you know, priestly language of mathematics. And but Buddha said no. Reality, he said, like quantum, he said reality itself can be fully experienced because we are part of it, and actually we can expand our mind by awakening to be aware of ourselves in all parts of it actually, and be aware of it. Like a um, CAT scan is aware of something, you know. CAT scan goes out and it reproduces the structure of whatever it merges with, right? It doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, have to write a description of it that would be helpful. It just merges it so you can get a picture. And then your, your own interpretations are limited also by the fact that it's just a picture or you see it from a certain angle. But the CAT scan itself experiences, you could say it experiences what it scans by merging with it, it doesn't make a formula for it, you follow? So the human being is capable of that, is what Buddha discovered. And it's capable, and we've all had moments of empathy with other beings. We've had moments where, I know one lady, an old friend of mine, Gela, who got very interested in Buddhism, she went to Mount Holyoke College, and she was in a course taught by a Christian, Japanese Christian gentleman on Buddhism, and he was discussing Nagarjuna. <laughs> the great philosopher of emptiness a few hundred years after Buddha. And she suddenly felt she was not just a person listening to the lecture, but she was also the chair that she was sitting in. <laughs> so she became one with her own chair. <laughs> and a visceral experience, as if she was the chair, as well as herself listening. It was like one thing. So this made her very interesting, and she interested, and she, she went on for years studying Buddhism. And I think she did she expanded her mind further than the chair, I think, later. But that was her start off. That was the start. And uh, so that's the grand, the grand unified theory is that there is no theory except that, that there is no theory. You have to step out of your conceptuality in some way, and you have to merge with reality, because you are a relative being, and your mind can expand without limit, actually. A Buddha is a being whose mind has expanded without limit. So therefore, my, the main point I'm trying to make, and the reason I'm going to make this in the context of Buddhist medicine in its Tibetan form, is that, you know, it's based, Buddhist medicine itself is based on someone who had a complete experience of reality. It's empirical. In Buddhist epistemology, experience, direct experience of this kind of merging with something, you know, grokking it, it was the old language used to say in the 60s, or just being one with whatever you're studying, is unlimited, and it's, can be, it's complete. And it, it, in order to do it, though, it recognizes that that with which you merge is something amazing. It has so many dimensions and so many, uh, you know, things about it that no particular little verbal description or even a picture from a particular perspective or a combination of pictures from many perspectives will not be equal to what it really is. It's something extraordinary. And in a way, you know, I'm very fond nowadays of the, what's called the Kala Chakra. The Wheel of Time, it's called, or I call it the Time Machine. But not like H.G. Wells' Time Machine, it's where time itself is a machine. But that, I don't want to go into that. But I'm just saying, there's a big fuss in the Kala Chakra system about how a Buddha's mind and body have no atoms. 
So if you can think of, right, there's a moment, the quantum people say there's a moment where you have a wave particle paradox. You don't know whether something, you may be following something as a particle, and then at some point it behaves as if it was a wave, sort of an unlimited expanse type of thing, and it does a kind of odd things. And then two particles, apart by a million miles or something, according to their experiments, can influence, you influence one and influences the other instantaneously faster than light, without any gap at all. Which is, they can, it's called spooky action at a distance. They think it's spooky because there's no spooks for them, you know, it's all matter. You know. But uh, enlightenment means you are capable of awareness at that level. In other words, you know physically, you know experientially that you are light, made of light. And your mind sees everything as light, if you could imagine. And therefore, from that deep basis, it can shape things, like uh, because it's more reality is more plastic at that level, and therefore a Buddha can do all kinds of extraordinary things. But I, we don't have to push to that level; we just stay on the theory level. So the theory level is Buddha already discovered what materialist scientists considers the holy grail, the gut theory or grand unified theory. Already dis found it, and but there's new bad news for the, those who want to have a conceptual grasp is that you, you will realize it when you, op you let go of your grasp and you give yourself to reality somehow. You open yourself to, and that's why the emptiness is emphasized, because uh, although there is no, em emptiness itself is empty, meaning there is no emptiness a place apart from the world, that somehow the world, it's not like space, space is just an analogy. Emptiness is all the relative things, even like, you know, then one hand hitting another is emptiness. It's just as empty as maybe some space in the atoms of the hand, you know, like we would have a model, if, you know, from our Western atomic scientists that, you know, mostly material things are made of atoms that are mostly empty except for a nucleus and some electrons and, you know, this kind of thing, right? Protons and whatever. And then there's this odd thing where light, when it, when light itself moves at a speed where mass becomes infinite. So, according to materialism, but, you know, it becomes unmeasurable, in other words. But consciously, we are that conscious light, actually. That's what, if you boil down, you take yourself and throw yourself into an electronic accelerator, might not be really good for your, for your complexion and your, your metabolism. It might be the end of you. But the atoms that make you up would go through that thing and they would disappear under analysis and they would be all shattered and then they'd be looking for Higgs boson desperately trying to recover <laughs> some reason for things seeming to have mass. But that's because we are actually made of light and Buddha actually experienced that and many, many millions of people experienced it. And therefore, the medicine, the linguistics, the sciences that they created were based on an understanding of reality by direct experience. That's a really, really key point. And you know why? A lot of people who become interested in quote-unquote alternative or complementary medicine, they are really into it, and then they go someplace and then someone says, oh, you have like a tumor somewhere. And they collapse. And they hand themselves over uh, to the surgery and the chemo and the whole thing, and um, they still don't have really good results. They occasionally have some publication of a miracle thing. And occasionally somebody recovers, but I've had a bunch of friends who just is right down the drain. Because, in a way, that's, that's poison, you know. Chemotherapy is poison. And you, you are already poisoned if you have cancer. Meaning your organs are not, and your immune system is not cleansing your mutant cells, which are lots of them. We all have mutant cells all the time. And so, then you throw them a completely undigestible poison on top of all those organs that are not functioning optimally. And it doesn't really make sense that this would help, except in shocking someone who had some underlying strength. It's the only reason that it would work. It just makes no sense otherwise, basically. So, so, but, so, so therefore, it's a, and it's a huge effort for those of us. Even, you know, we might say, well, I went to a psychic and maybe I was Cleopatra in a previous life. Or I was like a, a goddess, something. And people might have a belief about that. But actually, the way we live day to day, because we live in a consensual reality where it's just this one life, so we only arrange our pension until death. We may buy a cemetery plot. 
we may arrange for a, uh, some cash for a funeral so the family will not be inconvenienced, etc. You know, but we don't plan beyond that. We don't take actions thinking that well, I'll get a I'll get a result from this in another life. We do not, because we're in a consensual reality where this is all there is. We are our bodies, basically, and that is scientifically incorrect from the point of view of Buddha and millions of other people. And it's a kind of psychotic view, actually, because what it means is if your mind and soul are ultimately nothing, when the body stops functioning, you know, when you're flatlined, that means that they are now nothing. It's just that your body is making you think you're something. So you're, you subliminally have a notion of your reality as that you actually are nothing. And therefore people feel kind of, I, I have no purpose in life. It's useless, you know, it's bang, you know, that solves it. And I'm in that nice sleep, you know, and they will, what's the name of our cemeteries? Eternal rest. The deep sleep cemetery, you know, and you have a little marble thing there, but you're like, uh, unconscious. And it's terrible, and then they say, we all say, oh, those guys in Congress who, who are denying the reality and facts of the planet. Oh, they say, oh yeah, we really like our grandchildren, oh yeah, we really care about it. But, Clearly, they don't care enough mm -hmm. to turn off whatever it is, you know, to, and to live a little like make up, you know, learn to, to to get their inner fire to stay warm in the winter. They don't do that. So, Buddha, the emptiness is a physical, scientific discovery, and it is the discovery of total relativity. And there's no barrier to that, and there's no limit to that, there's no seemingly absolute to that relativity of the speed of light, which is one that Einstein left there. And Einstein also was hoping he would find something in the subatomic world, a kind of objectivity that would fit with his theories, which he never did, although he was a very happy guy there in Princeton. I personally met him, and he was quite jolly the one time that I met him. And I'll tell you that story another time. And, uh, but he never found that. And they're never going to find it. And because there's no such thing. Because our concepts are, now, that doesn't mean Buddhism, uh, there's a kind of way of teaching Buddhism that you're supposed to empty your mind and not study anything and just meditate and don't think anything and then you're going to be enlightened. And that's very uh, harmful to people to teach that, actually. That is a bad misunderstanding of the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha never said that. He doesn't think that. And if you, you're, you're human, the greatness of you as human beings is your ability to understand things. And, and Buddha is the one who challenges you by saying that against all kinds of other authorities in religious traditions and in other scientific traditions, they tell you, oh, you can't understand, so you have to rely on the scripture or that authority or some other thing because you can't understand yourself. You know, I, when I was a kid, it always made me mad. I went to, I went to some church. Uh, and to actually mostly played basketball and argued with the pastor <laughs> because I didn't like part of the story. I always liked Jesus, but I didn't like part of the story about I thought God had a bad temper. And I had myself had a bad temper and as a youth, I was very impatient. So I thought, well, that can't be like such a great person if he's just as angry as I get. And so I used to argue with him. And then on the other side, I, I, in science class, oh yeah, nobody, no, nobody understands everything. You study and study. And you find a lot out about this little piece, and then you, what you know is how much more you don't know. They make a misunderstanding of Socrates' famous thing about how the, he was the wisest man in, in Greece, but he didn't know anything. And then he just said that to get a dialogue going with people to see what idiot ideas they had, and to draw them out, you know, Socrates. But he was actually very wise. So it was proven by the fact that he was perfectly unafraid of dying when, when he was uh, uh, you know, accused and he could have escaped. And he didn't. So, inexpressible absolute relativity, and that everything is in a way ultimately indivisible, although relatively speaking we are all very diverse, and that, that fits with our being totally interwoven. He made predictions that have proven true in physics. Karma is not a mystic, mystical theory. Karma is a biological theory. Long ahead of Darwin, Karma means we are all related to all different kind of animal species. And we are much more related than Darwin, because Darwin 
was mad at the church because he lost his beloved daughter and you know he did he didn't like you know, he got mad at God when things didn't go well, like, like Brahma said in the ancient scripture that Darwin didn't get to read. It, was, it wasn't translated at that time. And so Darwin has our genes interconnected, and Richard Dawkins and all those biologists who write these learned tomes that you've read if you're a science reader, you know, you like to read science books. But in a way, nobody's, you know, the genes are connected to the chimp, right? We have genes that are like a chimp, it's like 90-some percent. But just the genes, we're not related to a chip because we're not related to anything because we don't exist, right? Whereas in Buddha's Darwinian theory, we were all personally chips, but we now progress. We don't have less hair, we have a language, we have a little different teeth structure, we don't have tails, unfortunately, so we're not good at climbing trees as chimps. We have the same kind of temper and social system. But, uh, and we can, you know, we created nuclear weapons and we can destroy the planet, which chimps couldn't do. And uh, we're and we're busy doing it, actually, and not only all the, destroying all the chimps. But in other words, it, it, the karma is a biological theory acknowledging the genetic interconnection of beings and, and the individual super subtle sort of, you know, mind of a being can go, it's, it jumps to the next life. It doesn't just, it's not just the genes are deposited by having children, you know, which is the, you know, the selfish gene, you know, that, uh, that Dawkins wrote about, you know, you, you run around and go around and have a lot of kids, so your genes, your genes make you do it, because <laughs> they want to run around like a bunch of greedy pack men. They want to go packing somewhere else, and then they want to dump themselves somewhere. It's like they, they, they anthropomorphize the genes into some kind of, having some kind of consciousness. When they deny consciousness to the humans, those materialist scientists tend to do that. If you call it the selfish gene, which is absolutely wrong, the human is great because we are incredible, cooperative, and we have this fa fabulous embodiment that we have because our cells cooperate with each other in another way. That's quite different from being just you know like the cells in my hand are not selfishly ignoring the cells in my liver, but my liver is not ignoring my hand. Right? They're all interconnected. So, so karma is a biological theory. Psychology, that's the main thing, as Gala was saying. Seeing how, and the ignorance is not just a passive ignorance, like we don't know the number of fish in the ocean, as they say. The ignorance is an active misknowing. It's like, I know I'm Bob Thurman, and I think I'm really what I really am, and I think there's some essential thing in me that's really me, and I think it's fixed and it never changes. So that when I see a picture of myself 30 years ago, I feel I'm the same person there, even though my body is 100% different. And my memory and everything is all different. But, uh, so I have this kind of, you know, psychology studies that, and the way identity is formed, the way identity is transcended, the way identity is expanded, and then the art of shaping identity in these ideal ways. This is where Tantra comes in, you know. And so, so this is the scary thing. Buddha discovered relativity, that means we're all related. <laughs> you guys just think you're here visiting, but actually we're all relatives, every single one of us. And in some past life, you poor folks had the hard job, even you guys, of having been my mother. <laughs> I also was your mother, so we kind of even Stephen, but in, in, given in an infinite beginningless life, set of lives, you can't exclude any possibility. So we are all this interconnected, and we're going to be here forever also. They, they give you a way out. They sort of say, well, when you attain nirvana, you become Buddha, then you're not in the world anymore. But that's false. Yonsu Nyanali Dewa doesn't mean, which Buddha, you know, when Buddha left his body, they call it power nirvana. People have translated that from the beginning, final nirvana. But he attained final nirvana already under the tree when he was 35. Pari means thorough. It doesn't mean final. So it means he just expanded his awareness and his energy, his subtle body, to encompass all life. He didn't manifest a particular continuum of another physical body in order to show people some kind of lesson of impermanence and his, and his lack of omnipotence so that they wouldn't think, oh, he could have saved me, he's the Buddha, he knew everything and he didn't do it and I'm still here suffering, which, which he, he wanted to show that it has to be up to them. They have to take responsibility for themselves. So the scary thing is we're here forever, right? You're not going to get out, as I like to say, nobody gets out of here a day. You know that 
That's a my pun on nobody gets out of here alive. <laughs> nobody gets out of here a dead. You endlessly are going to be alive, and therefore, just like between whatever you think your logical age, a hundred, is, is, you plan to have a reasonable circumstance, you book yourself, and you come to Menla to improve your mind, you learn other things, you do things, you save your money, you have a pension, you do whatever you can. You try to avoid the Republicans if you're smart. And, and you, but just up till death, you know. But now you suddenly, we're all suddenly in the, having to figure out how to travel further than that. Where are we going to go and how are we going to go? How, how do we travel? How do we book a good future life? That becomes a question. And it isn't maybe that easy. It's like, are you, are you a lucid dreamer? Can anybody here do lucid dreaming? In other words, are you capable of waking up in a dream, staying in the dream, but shaping what happens to you to some extent, having some free will in the, in the sequence of images or experiences that happen to you in a dream, are you? Or are you just impulsively directed, whatever happens? And if it's a nightmare, you get all frightened and wake up in a sweat. If it's a pleasurable thing, you wake up all teary. But it just sort of happens to you. Which is it? Right? I mean, you don't have to answer me. I, I can't barely, I, occasionally I seem to have one, but not much after many years, because I haven't really worked on it, because I'm a bad yogi, I'm not a good nagwa. I have to learn that from Gela. But point is, you can know from whether you are, can be conscious in your dream of whether you can be conscious in your be, at between state, the bardo state, what they call it, which simply means the between state. I don't like they call it intermediate state, it's like intermediate Greek, you know, <laughs> Sanskrit, you know, silly. It's a between. It's all part of just means between. You know. And um, so, so that's the frightening thing. But the good thing, you know, I, I, I was going to all that because I want to say what the really good thing is. The really good thing that the Buddha discovered is that the real deepest reality level of it, the plenitude, the happiness, the bliss, the freedom, is the more powerful energy what they call the clear light of voidness, or the clear light of emptiness, is actually an infinitely abundant, benevolent energy that is, wants to share itself with every being and everything, so there's no sense of incompleteness or depletion. So, actually, the Four Noble Truths have been badly misunderstood outside of the Buddhist cultures. You know, the famous thing that the Buddha first taught, where he said the Four Noble Truths, the First Noble Truth, is suffering, second is the cause of suffering, third is freedom from suffering, fourth is the path to the freedom from suffering. You all know that, probably most of you. If it's new to anybody, we can talk more about it. So that's what he used as a framework, and it still is the framework. And if you notice, by the way, it's like a medical diagnosis. It's, you know, if you're driven by misknowing, by delusion, you will suffer. There is a reason, and that is the delusion, and then the various, various distorted addictive energies, mental addictions that arise from that delusion. And that you have this, by understanding that cause, you can interfere with that cause. But then the reality, the, the prognosis, is the third noble truth. And that one of the, four, of the four of them is the only one in Buddhist science that refers to actual reality. The others are kind of illusory delusion-based reality, even the path, although that's a good shaping of the delusion toward freedom from it, it's still in the deluded reality, the path, you know? That's the fourth one. The one that is reality is the third one, and that's nirvana. So the reality of us all is nirvana. We're in it right now. So smile. <laughs> that's what Buddha said. Now, he didn't say that to everybody right away. Some people he noticed that they were so, had such a strong sense of feeling isolated and sort of in their absolute self somewhere, you know, and their identity was so rigid in inside about themselves, of whatever they were, you know, whatever their class was, whatever their gender was, whatever their social, their nation, whatever tribe, whatever it was, that they couldn't imagine that they were an infinite plenitude of total bliss. They were like a drop of bliss in an ocean of bliss. That would be unimaginable. So two things, they would think he was just deceiving them, 
Or someone might wrongly interpret it as thinking, well, then it doesn't matter what I do, and I can just do whatever I feel like. And they wouldn't sort of they'd ignore the, uh, the first and the second and the fourth noble truth and sort of feel that it's all fine, so whatever. And especially he was nervous, I think, about the rulers of his time, the little would-be tyrants. You know, governments are considered a whole, of something a little dangerous in Buddhist history. Whatever form, you know, they could always morph into something dangerous to people. And uh, so it was, if some ruler thought, oh, well, it's just nirvana, I can sort things out anyway, even if like, I kill half the people, it doesn't matter, they're just going to be in nirvana in another life, or whatever. Uh, they would behave badly. So, so to some people, he let them think that there was a place outside the world, we call it the dualistic form of Buddhism. This is the world of suffering, and the world of nirvana is some other place. But, and so he did let that spread, that idea. And you find it here and there, but in, the, in his, what is called his universal vehicle, the Mahayana, he's very clear that this is nirvana. Right? Already. It has always been, actually. And the only reason we think we are not in nirvana is our beginningless delusion. And it is, and in a way, therefore, it never really began our suffering. <laughs> and if we if we cut focus on that and we find it non-beginning, we will find freedom from it actually. And we will, and that freedom will be a kind of freedom, and a kind of discovery, which you've all had. You know, where you learn something that once you learn it, you feel you always knew it, you know, that kind of thing? But you hadn't paid attention to, so that it was like very familiar to you when you got to it, you know? Oh, I knew that, but I wasn't thinking, I wasn't listening to it, I was distracted from what I knew. Do you know what I mean? There are these kind of experiences we have cognitively. So the ultimate one of those is nirvana. When you discover what you've always been, which is blissful. You've been uh, bliss, bliss being. Always. And you had somehow contorted that into a inadequacy and dissatisfaction and, you know, oppression and victimization and all kind of things. But the reality of it always was that you were. That's why when Buddha attained that enlightenment, which was his thorough enlightenment already at the age of 35, as a scientist, discovering the nature of what was real, and within that reality, what is a realistic purpose for his life, before he had the fullest discovery of that, he remembered infinite previous lives of his own. And then he became aware of other beings' infinite previous lives. And although they don't emphasize that, because in, in, in the earlier, in the sort of more sim simple versions of the story, if you had infinite previous lives, you became completely aware of all of them. Meaning, meaning you could identify with every single form of life. Even from the amoeba, if that's a life form, bacteria up to a god, you sort of knew you had been all of those, many t infinite numbers of times. So they were all linked with you. And then suddenly you saw every other being was like that also. And then you would realize that you totally have been entwined with every other being forever, already. And then you look forward to the future and you realize that you are also everywhere in the future and every other being is going to be everywhere in the future. And then you realize that it's not nice for them to continue in their delusion into the future of not knowing that everything is fine. So you commit to, because you are one with them, you're enfolding with them, you commit to healing them, leading them to their own, but not just that you, because you can't ultimately just, you know, snatch their mind away from their delusion and make them a Buddha mind. You can't do that. Because that would be, they, they you know, a paranoid person who, I, I have my boundary, don't step on my toe. In the subway, don't sit on my leg. Don't, don't sit up next to me. <laughs> you know, someone squeezes in you and on the seat, you'll get up so that they won't touch you, you know. So, you know, I'm a being like that. And then they are flooded with a bliss energy from some guy. They're going to become more uptight. What, what, what are they trying to do to me? Trying to make me happy? No. <laughs> it's like, go, go, go hug a paranoiac and see what happens. They think you're like going to smack them, you know, it's a smackdown, you're after them, you know, they'll fight you off. So the point is, people have to open up to their own reality by their own understanding. And so what compassion makes a being, automatically do, who feels one with all the other beings, and is blissful and sees their actual reality as bliss, but sees their own misinterpretation of reality as making them feel they are suffering, 
All they can do is figure out how to enfold them in circumstances that, and learnings and experiences that will enable them to realize their actual nature, just like you did. Do you follow? It becomes automatic. That's the compassion side. You know? But, uh, but um, so that's, the, and then, then the medicine comes out of that. And, uh, you know, the Ayurveda people think that their medicine in India, they think that the Brahmins, you know, who have their Ayurveda, they have a whole story about it because they, they had Buddhism eroding the rigidity of their caste system and their high Brahminical nature for 1,500 years. And most of the great Buddhists were originally born Brahmin or Kshatriya because they were tended to be better educated. So they were, you know, so the class thing was much more loose. But then they were conquered because also they also became less violent as a culture. And they no longer were beating off Alexander the Great. They were succumbing to these invaders from Persia and Tajikistan and wherever. And uh, so uh, they, uh, uh, they then reasserted their sort of rigidity of things. You know, and they think that their medicine came from the Vedas. But actually, it was the Buddhist monks who didn't mind dealing with a woman, who didn't mind as long as there was some chaperone, who didn't mind uh, dealing with untouchables or low caste people and bringing healing medicine to them. This gentleman here, who we have this nice statue someone brought us from Thailand. This is Jivaka, who was the uh, statue of Jivaka, who was the Buddha's physician in the Buddha's time. And uh, he, he, was, uh, he was a surgeon, actually. He had, was a, had great knowledge of medicine. And then the Buddhists expanded that. You know, they were the barefoot doctors in India for a thousand years. It's beginning, there are some scholars beginning to go against the Brahminical, you know, story that it all came from God and they have it and that's it. And actually, Ayur means long life. And so that's only one of eight branches of Buddhist medicine, the longevity branch. And they have gynecology and they have pediatrics and they have surgery and they have dealing with people who cut up in wars and all kinds of other things. You know, diet, lifestyle, things like that. And the Ayurveda does sort of incorporate it, but they emphasize the Ayur because those old Brahmins, they want to live a long time. They enjoy their, they eat its cookies, you know, people come and offer, you know, barfis and things to the Ganesha, and then they eat them. <laughs> Afterwards. They do. And they all have these great bellies, you know. Those Brahmin priests, really beautiful, smooth bellies. Okay. So, so that's the thing, and it's it, and and uh, so the good news is everything is perfect. It's no problem. We're all in your mind. The bad news is we don't know that, and we have to learn, not just meditate, but then we also have to meditate once we learn. We have to learn about it. And another good news is that the Tibetans kept this great achievement of Indian civilization, of the great universities for 1,500, maybe 1,700 years. That was destroyed then by lesser people uh, driven by an aggressive ideology, and uh, who were dissatisfied and were not nice to their wives, and therefore they were dissatisfied and aggressive and frustrated, so they were violent. And um, Tibetans kept it alive, and they developed it more, and they refined it, and someone like that gentleman, that amazing person there, uh, you're talking on Dengompo, the little golden one over there. Uh, he sent, he, he, he was, uh, his, his elder, his senior in his lineage was worked with a king, an emperor in Tibet who brought people from Persia, from China, from Mongolia, and also dealt with all the Tibetan shamans around. And he formed a kind of unified medicine of everything in the world, the best stuff in the world. And then 300 years later, or so, his heir, this Yutok Yondengumbo, the younger, brought it into a beautiful, workable learning system, totally magical, beautiful learning system. And, um, and so we have something even better than what they had in India. And we have, like, you know, the Buddhist science, we have Abhidharma, but then they have, I call it Tantric Abhidharma Gemma, like Book of the Dead. It's like Mumizu of Tantra. You know, it isn't just some magical mystery, it is magical, but it also is scientific, you know, it's an analysis of the super subtle mind and the subtle mind and all of that, which in the regular Abhidharma, they didn't, you know, the Hinayana Abhidharma, they didn't really deal with. And um, 
So the Tibetans, you took the final fruit of, at around a thousand years ago of the great Indian universities before they were burned down by the invaders. And their libraries, giant library at Nalanda University was nine stories high. And when they lit all the books, it burned for six months, they say. There were so many texts and books there. But luckily, the most important ones mostly have been translated into Tibetan. And so we can recover that knowledge. That's, we're in the process of doing that. Some people are. A few of us. Make it, but it's not a priority, as I said, because the academics, they think well, it couldn't be that great because those people didn't have a PhD from Oxford or Harvard or whatever, or the Sorbonne. So that's so silly, you know. Okay, so that's, that's the intersection. But what our job is, since you are here, and we're looking about the medicine, so our, other, our longer learning job is, without rejecting what I call industrial medicine, I don't like to call it modern, because Tibetan medicine is also modern, and there are other great herbal traditions, Islamic one, India, there are four legal medical systems, actually, including Tibetan one, in India, which is a very sensible culture. And um, they don't have this sort of uni one thing with one lobbying group controlling it with the pharma and the whole thing, terrible system we've got, gotten into nowadays in this country. And, um, but our faith is, at a subconscious level, is still stuck with the materialists because they can do these amazing things like destroy everything. <laughs> and they do also some great things like, you know, like retinal surgery and things like that, which are exquisite, you know. And uh, although Buddhists did cataract stuff, they did surgery too, but I don't know if they did a squirrel buckle operation when you have a retinal detachment. I don't know if they had that one, but maybe, you know, I, I'm, I'm open-minded to it. I, my knowledge is not enough to say. But there, but there are some marvelous things that uh, modern some people have done, but they are mishandling their powerful modern, modern weapons, and they will mishandle them on, on us if we don't take responsibility ourselves and be our own physicians in some sense, and connect our health to our lifestyle, to our ethics, to how we earn our money, to what our purpose in life is, to our sense of self and how we develop that. And uh, we have to do, we have to take responsibility for that. And diet, for example, they don't really give us much, you know, if you've ever been hospitalized, you've got fed powdered potatoes and weird stringy, like, you know, <laughs> hormone injected Salisbury steak. And like all kind of weird things they gave you, right? Even, well, maybe if you're vegetarian, they give you something. Some carrots. <laughs> or something. But they don't know how to cook anything better than that in those, most of those hospitals. So, so that's it. So that's the inner science. So she, the reason for me talking about it in the context of mainly medical studies is for us to begin to, to shift our sense of confidence. We have to be more critical about the materialist ideology that underlies us. We have to face the possibility of, of karmic biology, meaning that we're going to have more lives, and how do we direct those lives in a positive way? What is the purpose of that? And even, ultimately, how do we direct our understanding and intelligence and effort to really understanding the universe, like a Buddha, and becoming a Buddha? And uh, maybe it's not possible for many of us in this life. I, I don't think I'll make it in this life, but in a few lives, I think maybe I can. I hope so. I'm working on how to be reborn where, instead of meeting Genla when I'm practically dead, <laughs> I might meet him when I'm young. And, and the next life, maybe he'll be younger than me that time, because he'll live longer than me. So then he'll be younger than me. But uh, <laughs> you know, the other emanations will teach me. At a younger age, you know. He went and lived in a cave, and he ate, he ate powdered stones for how long? How long was it, Gilbert? Months? Yeah. What? A few weeks. A few weeks. And he had amazing visions and things. The Julet, what's called Julet. I'm sure he'll talk about it this time. Okay, so that's inner science. And you need that yourselves. You don't have to believe me. Just look at it. I'm not asking you to believe me, but if you want to disagree with me, that's good. I love to debate. Dialogue is important, so I'm ready to debate at any time. And that is how Buddhists learn. They're dialogical, like Socrates was. You know. Socrates was contemporaneous with some very great Indian Buddhist teachers. And he, that, that dialogue thing that he did, Buddha, Buddha also always did dialogue. People would ask him something, he would say, ask them back a question. And uh, one of my favorite sutras 
He had this one young king who had killed his father and mother and tried to kill Buddha and failed. He came to talk to Buddha and he asked Buddha, well, what's the purpose of life? Why do you guys become monks and spend your life studying and meditating? And what's the purpose of that? Being a seeker, a shramana, what they call it. And Buddha said, your majesty, I, can, I know. He didn't mention all the evil deeds that particular king had done years before. But he said, I know that uh, the way you asked me that question, you've already asked a lot of spiritual teachers that question. And uh, how come you didn't, you were unsatisfied with their answers that you're now asking me? And may I ask you who you asked and what they said? So then he makes that king tell him six different versions of the purpose of life, including one materialist, another fatalist, and various kinds of theists. And there are, you know, six of them who were giving him their ideas. And then each time, he then said, well, did you like that? Your man said, no, I didn't think that made sense. The king himself didn't think it was practical. So then he says, well, okay, now I've sent six people I asked, your, uh, your uh, Buddha, Shak Mr. Shakyamuni, uh, Mr. Gautama, and now what do you say? And so then uh, the Buddha says, well, that, well, okay, I'll tell you, but first let me ask you another question. Now I didn't tell you I have to go along with you, so let me ask you a question. He says, suppose you had a servant who worked for you day and night, he slaved till late at night, he got up at four in the morning to clean up your mess after your parties, and then he, then he got up early and then he's late, late cleaning up, and then he got up early to make the breakfast and the food, and he was, he was your slave or servant. And suppose you had someone like that. Yeah, I have people like that, the king said. Then he said, well, suppose this guy thought to himself, you know, what is my karma? I'm serving this king and he's just having a good time. Maybe I should get some good karma, good some merit, you know, I should do some virtuous thing, improve my mind, so in a future life I can be waited on by somebody. Or at least, you know, at least they just started that way. And then he asked permission, can I go and join the order of the seekers, you know. And would you deny him permission? No, I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't, because it's a very virtuous thing, it's established now in our society. Okay, so then he leaves, shaves his hair, goes and puts on an orange robe, goes out, he learns a few things, and he meditates, etc. And then, Your Majesty, he might come back around by the palace on a Sunday afternoon when you are going through the royal ritual of feeding the monks, feeding the ascetics, the seekers, the sadhus. And if he came there, what would you do? Would you put him back into your service? No, 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 no. I would feed him uh, uh, rice and ghee and honey and all sorts of things. I would wait on him, hand and foot. Oh, okay. Your Majesty, would you say that was the first fruit of the homeless life from having waited on you day and night, now you wait on him and serve him lunch? Was that a fruit? And the king had to say yes. That's a benefit of this life of seeking and developing a higher purpose, spiritual education. And then he goes on and he goes all the way to Nirvana with that guy, you know. And so, but he first gets the king on this, and you can tell, hear the king in his mind thinking, why did I let him go? He used to make me food. Now I'm giving him food. You know, it's so, Buddha was so, that was dialogue, right? And it was so, so smart, you know, Buddha was really a great teacher, you know. And totally practical. You know, he got that king right where he was. And then the king was ready to listen to Nirvana. And then the king confessed his evil deeds of killing his parents. And then he was sort of really flipped out to king. He had like a big thing being in Buddha's presence, but then he suddenly jumped up and ran away. He said, oh, I'm really busy, I gotta go back to my court. And then when he left, Buddha said, oh, if he'd only hung out a little longer and seen a little more deeply into his remorse and regret for having killed his parents and, and they tried to kill me, but Buddha wasn't mentioning that at all because you can't kill a Buddha, but you drew blood from him, which is a very bad karma. And, uh, uh, he would have been, he would have developed what he called the Dharma Eye, the realistic, the reality eye. Now when people translate that Dharma Eye, things you've read about Buddhism, they say spiritual eye or religious eye, because they think it's a religion. But Dharma Eye, Dharma means, the word Dharma, means reality, ultimately. And then it becomes, it means teaching in the sense of teaching what is the nature of reality that enables you yourself to understand reality. That's what it means. So Dharma eye means a realistic eye. So this is the thing. Be realistic and you're practicing the Dharma. And the reason that's the case is that reality was discovered by the Buddha 
and by all many millions of people later who followed that educational process, to be fine. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is the suffering. It brings the suffering. Wisdom brings the bliss of knowing what is real. If you know what's real, then you know everything is okay. You're going to be okay. Okay? Thank you. Dylan. That's inner science. Okay? Only as the platform, the support for the zoonic part, the healing science, right? So it means repair, right? Doesn't that what it means? Repairing science. And then this, do you all know this medicine Buddha? Does everybody know what that is? Anybody doesn't know who, who's the blue Buddha over here? Oh, you all know. I, I don't want to repeat. No? Some people don't know? No. Well, the medicine Buddha, that is Shakyamuni Buddha. That's Gautama. Because when Buddha, uh, but there are seven, seven brothers in the, in the former universe, in, a, a former, in the multiverse, a previous universe, and those seven brothers being aware of all of his time and space, you know, and when you become enlightened, you know all the future, actually, easily, and the past, completely. If there's no time, the fact that we're just here in the moment, your moment expands to encompass everything. So they looked in the future, and they said, and not just in sort of general, because it doesn't exist, it's like right here, some people might think, but it, with it existing, exactly what's going on. And they looked in the future, and they saw, oh, that's Shakyamuni Buddha. He's the fourth Buddha of the thousand Buddhas in that particular universe on that particular planet. Although they're supposedly in other planets similar, there, even in this universe. And he came to the planet at a time when it was really tough. When people were violent, there were a lot of wars, they got sick easily, they only live about a hundred years, and there are lots of planets where humanoid beings live a lot longer. So he's going to need medicine. It's because they're going to need to go overcome all their sicknesses to be able to study so they can achieve freedom by studying with him. If they're sick all the time, they won't be able to study. So we're going to go down with him, and when he comes, we're going to re-emanate, and we're going to inspire him, and he's going to be the eighth medicine Buddha with us. And we're going to then teach, uh, teach, uh, teach people how to take care of themselves so they'll be able to be alert and alive for the purpose of human life, which is to become enlightened which you all can do as human beings. And this is the best biological form in which gods are smarter than us, some of the gods. They are smarter than us, but their problem is they are too self-indulged because they have things too easy. So they think, oh yeah, I'll study tomorrow. I'll meditate the day after tomorrow. I'm having fun now. I don't want to be bothered. And then suddenly they cease, you know, they, they're also impermanent and they pass away. So the human is like really intelligent like a god but also very vulnerable and has a limited time and they can, we can know that and anticipate that. So then we, uh, uh, we have a motive to learn and once we learn we can develop wisdom and become free. So, that's, so then Shakyamuni himself turned blue because that's the color of ultimate reality perfection wisdom. So it's the source of all the other healing wisdoms and um, he um, it wasn't, he didn't just turn blue because he was upset about everybody being sick. He turned blue because that's a healing energy wisdom, the deepest healing energy in some, in a different system, but that's, in, that's the main system. Okay? And then he has the eight, the other seven Buddhas are above him. <coughs> See the seven brothers? And then there are other people who help them, they're, 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 who are the nurses and things, the bodhisattvas. And there's a mandala of them, a powder mandala over there. And... Um, so that's the medicine Buddha. Okay. And then, and then, yes, and my wife, who made Menla work, function so, thus far, and now we have wonderful people also working there. Uh, after it was given to us, she turned it into the useful facilities that it is. And uh, she said when she first, when we first received this, and she kind of looked at the job and took a lot of work, she said, I want this place to be such that anybody even sets foot on it and they feel 100% better while they're here. They feel happy, they smile. They don't look all sour and worried. They feel something's lifted off them. I want to have it be like that. That's what she said. Where is she? She's snoozing. She's so tired of Sleep meditation. What? Sleep meditation. Sleep meditation. Yes. Okay, that's enough for me tonight. Okay, Gemma, you have the mic back.
<laughs> this is the one that worked. I'm not going to say another word. <laughs> Thank you. What are you handing out here? Uh, oh, nine volt purification. Really? Oh, good. Excellent. Uh, so, about the uh, root cause of the sicknesses, three or five mental poisons, and then bed number 64. Then the other causes of sickness about diet, wrong diet, American fast food, soft drinks. And then the next one is the seasons, different seasons. How about the seasons today? Today we have our seasons or the weather is called bipolar, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So the season is bipolar and many people are suffering bipolar disorders. Okay. So we don't know, you know, who got sick first, or the season or the humans. <laughs> but I think the humans we got first, you know, we, we get, uh, how do you say, the bipolar disorder and then because of our activities and we transmit that disease to the to the climate, <laughs> global warming. And then uh, there's another one in page number 65, it's called negative influences. So there are different kind of uh, disturbing energies in the nature and so they can influence our health. So that's including about uh, microorganisms, you know parasites and bacteria and virus and bad spirits, okay? That's called negative influences. And what then... Page are you on here? I'm sorry. Uh, page number 66. Okay. And then page number 66, we have lifestyle. Wrong lifestyle, okay? And uh, so today, of course, we know mainly like a wrong diet and wrong lifestyle. Those two are the major causes of uh, what do you say, this mortal disease, you know, cardiovascular disease uh, and oncology, cancer, two more of these things, right? And uh, new research says, yeah, over 80% of cardiovascular disease and uh, cancer is caused by wrong diet and wrong lifestyle. And uh, according to Soaric, Tibetan medicine says also that our aging process is something to do with uh, diet and lifestyle, okay, our aging process. And uh, so it, it seems like we can, if we can find a good or correct diet, so that's our best medicine. And if we know how to live well, or if we can have a good lifestyle, and that's also best therapy, you know. Okay, so it's interesting, both diet and lifestyle, uh, if we, um, if we do the wrong, eating wrong things and doing wrong stuff, and then we get sick, you know, that's the cause of sickness. But then if we correct it, and that's the, the remedy, right? So that's why I often say, there's a very, uh, um, how do you say, close relationship between Soa Rigpa and also ancient Greek medicine. If you look in the Greek medicine, uh, like uh, uh, Hippocrates, he said, uh, let the food be the medicine, let medicine be the food. You know that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's exactly, so Arikpa says the same thing. And then also lifestyle, according to Greek medicine, so one of the main healing methods and also one of the main cause of the disease. So as you see, uh, and actually the uh, good health or the sickness is our own choice, you know. We can't blame to karma. We cannot say it's, it's because of karma and we get sick and, you know, we get uh, old and then we die and so on, right? I think sometimes we are blaming too much to the karma. It's like ancient time in the, uh, in the West, in Europe, uh, before the medical, uh, how do you say, medical science, you know, before Hippocrates, and they said the sickness was the punishment from God. And the health is like God's, uh, how do you say, God's reward, something like that. So everything is depending on God. But then Hippocrates said it's wrong view. He says it's up to us, you know. The sickness is our own choice, and uh, you know our own choice, and also health, so our own choice. Mm -hmm. So that is exactly the same view according to Sohrikpa. And so I hope next uh, few days we can learn more about uh, these things, about diet and about lifestyle, and how to live uh, uh, 
correctly in different seasons and then also how to work with our inner poisons, okay? So those are the main causes of our sickness and so Aripa is mainly dealing with the causes. We call, we call it the primary cause or the root cause and then the secondary cause. The secondary cause is about diet, lifestyle, seasons and negative influences. Okay, so that's, uh, yeah, that's the basic thing. And then tomorrow morning, se 7, what time? 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock, so uh, you should come here. Then we, uh, you will learn this one, nine purification breathing. It's a very simple Tibetan uh, breathing, uh, like breathing meditation. And then after this, we have a special yoga, it's called the Nejan Yoga. Nejan Yoga is one of the easiest Tibetan healing yoga, okay? It's very, very simple, very easy. And everyone can do it, you know, right? So, yeah. Um, so we tomorrow morning seven to seven to nine or what? Seven to eight, one hour. Uh, seven to eight, okay. Morning early. So you will do this uh, breathing meditation and uh, nejan yoga. So it's a very simple yoga. Very very simple exercises combined with like uh, some kind of massage. Uh, that one in the morning. And then uh, after that we have, uh, tomorrow is empowerment, right? Tomorrow uh, you'll receive a short empowerment, so that's the uh, Tibetan, uh, how do you say, tantric system of Vajrayana, and how we do this inner transformation. The five poisons, how can be transformed into five wisdoms. So the empowerment means, uh, yeah, empowerment means like to empower. It's like the starting point. And then it is a kind of uh, guided meditation that then later you can use that, you know, to transform uh, the ignorant and the desire and anger, pride and jealousy and so on. So that we do uh, tomorrow morning. So that's a more like spiritual part. And then in the afternoon we do more uh, medical part, according to Sarikpa. And then... Um, the next days, uh, I think we focus more, so we have the, I want you have this book, copy of this book, so we do, according to Tibetan medicine, we do according to this book. And then we have some other, you have some other uh, materials too? Yeah, there'll be handouts um, tomorrow for the afternoon handouts. session, and then yeah. there'll be pamphlets for the different... There's um, some, like a special uh, meditation for longevity and, uh, what do you say, longevity, and also there are special uh, meditations, like, you know, uh, for rejuvenation. And uh, especially one uh, kind of spiritual rejuvenation, it's a very simple one, because then that one is more, more about fasting, you know, fasting and meditation. So, probably that will be the cheapest rejuvenation. <laughs> easy, easy and very cheap, you know. <laughs> Basically, you don't eat anything. So, <laughs> uh -huh. and like fasting, meditation, and it's a very, very effective. Uh, what do you say? It is a very, very effective. Um, uh, method, you know, effective. How do you call it? Meditation method. Yeah. Uh -huh. So this, and then of course. According to Tibetan tradition, we always work with body, energy, and, and mind. So we will focus on these things. And when we talk about the body part, we do more like uh, yoga and medicine. And then the energy part is more breathing and mantra. And then the mental part is more meditation. Yeah. So that will be our you know, next day's uh, program. And then professor is joining us. And, in afternoons or was that? Are you coming in afternoons or yeah, also morning? Yeah, afternoon. Uh -huh. Well, I'm coming tomorrow morning because of the initiation. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions? Sure. Yes. For the empowerment, what are do we have obligation for it? No obligations. <laughs> mm -hmm. No what? Obligations. Obligations. Oh, obligations. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's like this, yeah, that's a good question. Normally, when there's empowerment, there's always obligations, right? There's commitments. And um, 
Yeah, I don't think you need to have that commitment for UTOL's empowerment. It's actually, like Professor was saying, empowerment also it's a question of understanding. Right? We really understand about ourselves. We try to understand more about our, our inner dimension, you know, our poisons. When we don't see them, the poisons, they, they look like a darkness. Once you see it, there is no darkness. There are only different kind of lights, you know. So that kind of understanding and process is very important. Once you understand it, and then you can put it in practice. Okay? So that's about empowerment, yeah. Yes? Is the empowerment under like a certain lineage, like a Nyingma lineage or Utah Ning Nyingma? Non-sectarian, kind of yeah, it's a Utah lineage, according to Utah. So it's connected with Tibetan medicine, and we can call it a non-sectarian lineage. It's close to Nyingma school, but you know, it's for, uh, uh, yeah. Okay? The Yuto tradition known as Rime Tibetan. Rime means non sectarian. Mm. Uh -huh. Yes? Uh, just one more question. The idea of hooking the La? Yes. Is that part of the empowerment? Uh, when we are doing La, Eric? Um, it, I think it's with Tsewang too, yeah? Uh, for tomorrow. But then we have this uh, Lagu booklet, so it's as you like. Yeah. yeah, 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 we can do that together. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Looking back to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we'll. Little dream yoga instruction before what? we go? You want what? to do a little Menla dream yoga instruction before we head to bed? Oh, a sleep yoga, sleep yeah. Yoga. Not it's that sleep. dream, but sleep. Yeah. sleep yoga. Yeah, there is a special Menla thing that is a kind of a tradition. Uh, but to really explain it, we will come in subsequent days talk about the Tibetan Book of the Dead. But some of you may be aware of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And you may be aware that uh, when you, uh, according to the, the Tantric Abhidharma, the subtle body-mind Abhidharma of the book, so-called, it's not really the Book of the Dead, it's called the Book of Natural Liberation in the Between, by learning in the between state, or hearing in the between state. But hearing, when you don't have a lot of printed books, means learning. <laughs> It doesn't just mean hearing, you know, it means learning. So, so um, uh, you know, there are these four states when you die or when you pass out or when you fall asleep. When you sort of leave your ordinary five senses, you know, as you're falling asleep. You know, you're no longer seeing, you're no longer listening, hopefully if it's not too noisy. Uh, you don't smell, you don't taste, and you are touching your pillow, you know, and you're all cuddly and cozy, but then you forget about your body. And then there, then there are these four states of moonlit states, like a whitish light, a luminescent state. Then, although usually we don't notice that, a kind of bright heat state, like a reddish state. Then a dark state. And then in the dark state, we semi-lose consciousness. And when we sleep normally, we think that's where we are spending the night, in the dark. But the Menla special sleep yoga is that beneath that dark state, is the state of clear light. Clear light is not a bright light. It is a transparent light, like a diamond or a glass crystal, you know, that is transparent. You know, it's not like a, sunlight is bright, moonlight can be bright, and dark is dark. And this is something that is beyond dark and light. They say it's like a pre-dawn twilight light. But everything, nothing is obstructed because everything is transparent. So that's where the mind spreads everywhere, and where you feel connected to the vast energy of the universe. And that's why you feel refreshed when you wake up. If you were lying in a dark nothingness, why would that be refreshing? You'd be just, oh God, I'm still the same as I did when I fell asleep. So the Menla healing yoga, the Menla sleep yoga is, meditate as you fall asleep. Well, maybe I won't notice the moonlit state, I won't notice the sunlit state, I will notice the dark state, but I will not stay in the dark state. I will go into the transparency state where I will be one with all the energy of the universe. And may myself, my mind will get out of the way, my mind that divides me from the universe, and I will merge with all the positive energy in the universe. And then when I awaken, I'll feel like really lively and I'll be ready to hop up and do ninefold purification breathing <laughs> and Nejami yoga in the morning, okay? So that's the sleep yoga. And, it's good, and that is part of the work that I was saying about the inner science work. 
try to get out of the universe where the solution is to disintegrate and be nothing. And you can tolerate until now, till then, somehow, if you're reasonably healthy. <laughs> and if you get really bad on health, you call Jack Kevorkian. <laughs> so that's not a nice way to be. So but to train yourself when you fall asleep, okay, I'm going to float in the clear light. That's a great thing to do. That's our men special thing. Okay? Good night, everybody. Thank you, Gela. Thank you.